All right, hello. Welcome to this, probably the last episode of our tutorial. <laughs> uh, it's good that I still don't have complete certainty even when recording the actual episode, and I've already done a practice run of this. Um, but basically, uh, yeah, this might be a longer one than usual. It feels like about an episode and a half's worth of content to me. Uh, but because we're so close to the finish line, I just want to push through and, and do it uh, rather than split it into two. Uh, so, the three things we're going to do, are we're going to fix all the bugs in the game, <laughs> all in one long uh, string. Then we're going to make a score screen that happens when you die or when you win, and then we're going to make a tutorial. Uh, so, none of these things are too time consuming individually, uh, but it is three different things, so let's get to it. Um, bugs. What are the bugs that we have noticed? One is, when you drop a weapon and then pick it up again, the alert level goes up so with bug hunting uh let me uh, i'm actually going to write down my philosophy of bug hunting which is um number one uh don't fix until until you understand uh that's probably the only rule of bug hunting <laughs> uh, basically try and understand what's happening don't try and fix what's happening until you actually know it because usually the, the fix is incredibly simple it will be super easy to, to implement the fix uh, that all the difficulty is just in what is actually going wrong here but if you try and, and just guess at what's going wrong and try a fix without knowing for sure what is going wrong you can end up I mean a the fix probably won't work and B then you've got to undo your fix before you try another fix uh, and you're just kind of lost in the weeds you can do that forever it will just you don't get any closer necessarily um, so if our problem is that even when a weapon is just lying on the ground picking it up causes the alert level to go up I would say let's go straight to the source. Let's go to alarm manager. If, the, if our problem is to do with like an alarm level being raised when it shouldn't be, we have a particular method that is called for that, raise alert level, and there's a way to check all the references to it. And when I look at these references, uh, it's when you pick up ammo, it's when you pick up an antique, it's when you uh, take out a guard from behind, which we don't really do anymore, it's when you pick up a health pickup, it's when you pick up a weapon. Uh, this, I mean, this completely explains the bug. <laughs> it's because alert levels are raised when you pick up anything, seemingly, uh, under any circumstances. And also, it just kind of looks like bad code to me that all these different places are all doing the same thing. I mean, I don't know. I guess if we wanted it to behave that way, then it would be fine, but we don't, so it's not. Uh, so, what occurs to me is that all of these things that you can pick up have a usable on them, right? Um... In fact, this level, this is the boss level, and we've got to open. Um, it serves as a great example because we actually, I didn't notice this at the time, but all these health pickups and ammo pickups on the ground, those are raising our alert level when we pick them up, which is not at all what we want because plinths are supposed to be the alarmed things. Like, the whole idea is this is a museum. The things that are on the plinths are alarmed. That's what's protected by security. Anything else is not. Like, anything you feel on the ground obviously isn't. It's weird that I can see that through the block but i'm not going to worry about that too much <laughs> um so uh i think that since everything that can be picked up um sorry everything that we want to raise the alert level can be picked up then the alert level thing should be on the usable script i'm going to create a new variable on usable uh that just says public bool alarmed and so whether or not something is alarmed is going to be set by uh, is going to be stored on the usable component of whatever it is. And when you pick it up, uh, this is the bit where we pick it up. If it's alarmed, then references dot alarm manager dot raise alert level. That's what we'll do. We'll be the only ones doing that now. Um, and when that happens, I also want alarmed to equal false. So if the thing is hooked up to the alarm system and you should take it, it should raise the alert level. But after that's happened, this thing is no longer alarmed. That You, you solved that situation. <laughs> Not the most elegant way, but you've done it. It's no longer alarmed because you've already stole it and the alarm already raised. Um, so yeah, it should be unset. So that by itself will... Um, uh, is the right framework anyway. Um, the next thing I want to do is that plinths... There's a really handy way of, of doing this because we don't have to go around setting all those things on the different objects because, again, it's not the objects that are alarmed, it's the plinths. Um, and plinths are actually the thing that creates the item in the first place. 
when a plinth assigns its item, which is done by level generator, um, one of the first things we do is we get the usable component to that item. So right after we do that, why don't we say my usable dot alarmed equals true? So every time a plinth puts something on itself, places an item on the plinth, it says you are alarmed. And when the player first takes you, the alarm level will raise, and after that, you're fine. It will never happen again. Uh, so that's our new system, and that should work. But the old system is still in place, so we've got to delete that first. Uh, so all these references, ammo pickup, raise alert level. Nope, we're not going to do that. Antique behavior, raise alert level. Nope, we're not going to do that. Guard behavior, going to leave that alone because that's functionality that we is still in the game, but we don't really use it anymore. Um, I should probably remove it just because I haven't really tried using it to see if it breaks the game or anything, but um, uh, it's fine. You know how to remove it if you want to remove it. You know how to keep it in if you want to keep it in. And, oh, excuse me, I just deleted the very thing, didn't I? I just deleted the exact thing that I just created. <laughs> Let's not delete that. And then when you pick up a weapon, oh, that should also not raise the level. Uh, so let's do a quick test of that. I'm hoping it should be relatively easy to test. It's still loading in my changes. Okay, so when I pick up this, I should see no alert level raised. When I pick up this weapon, it does raise the alert level. When I pick up a second weapon, also raises it. When I pick up a third weapon, also raises it, that's fine. But I dropped one on the floor here, and when I pick up that, nothing changes, which is exactly what I want. And I can keep picking up these two in perpetuity. And I can pick up these, and that's all fine. Hello, boss. All right, that was a good demonstration of the next problem we're going to fix, which is that these health bars appear on top of our menu items. So, um, oh, actually, I should have shown you it, it in context. But basically, the, the key to that is that when the, these things are listed in this order, in the hierarchy, the lower down they are, the more on top they are, which is a bit weird, right? You would think intuitively, if it's on top here, it should be on top visually as well. That's the opposite. It's the lower down it is, the, the, the more prominent it is. Um, you can sort of think of it as like the most recent stuff is going to be added at the bottom, and the most recent stuff is kind of on top of the pile, if you're sort of handing out papers into a pile. Uh, that's the thing people do. Uh, anyway... The solution to it, one way we could do it, I'm going to tell you about a way that we're not going to use, which is it's health system that does this. When health system creates its its health bar in start, it's going to create a health bar object. Uh, and one of the things we could do is um, say health bar object dot transform dot set uh, set as uh, first sibling. So sibling is a bit of a weird word. It really means child. Uh, but it, it means amongst its other children, amongst the other children that, of the same thing, you can make it go to the top. We could do that, but actually I think there's a more elegant way to do this, and it'll be just useful in general. Because actually there's another problem here that's never come up yet, which is uh, all of our game UI, the alarm panel, the score stuff, let me get the game view up, all of this stuff actually is appearing on top of our menu already. It hasn't been a problem yet because they're at the sides and the menu's in the, in the front, but if, it ever, if they ever do overlap, we're going to have an issue there. So what I want to do, rather than sort of in code specifying where something goes in the hierarchy, let's make it a thing we can just customize in the inspector. So I'm going to um, I'm going to create a uh, game UI game object, and it's just going to be nested directly under the canvas. Um, I'm going to make it fill the screen. So I'm holding down Shift and Alt, and I'm going to click this bottom right thing to make it fill the whole thing. And one thing I like to do with, with Canva stuff is add an image to it just to check that I know what I'm doing. Uh, if I add a margin of 10, we can see that we notice that margin. Uh, that means that we're right about where this thing is. It, it really is filling the screen that we see. Because one of the things I want to check, actually, is what happens if we... Uh, so in my practice when I tried building the game, one of the things I noticed when I, when I played it on a normal screen is that our, some of our UI elements are not where I expected them to be. So... In the scene view, or the game view, you can choose what aspect ratio you're seeing. And if you pick 16 by 9, you'll see this. Um, and I am going to now drag everything that isn't a menu into this. So that's 
all of that is game UI, right? Alarm panel, score, use prompt, secondary weapon panel, main weapon panel, alarm countdown, that is all game UI. Uh, and I just want to check that it doesn't have any weird values. So alarm panel should go in the top left. Uh, weapon panels, bottom right. Okay, cool. Um, I messed this up really badly in my practice. <laughs> it took a lot of uh, repairing afterwards. So I'm glad to see that this is not uh, a disaster. So I'm going to turn that image off. Uh, you could just delete it, but uh, I'm going to leave it there in case I need it. And now game UI is above main menu, which means it will be behind main menu, according to our weird backward logic. Um, and the last thing to do is that uh, canvas behavior needs a reference to it. So I'll put it up here. It's going to be a public. I'm actually going to make a reference to the transform. So the transform is the bit that stores the size, the scale, and everything. Um, game UI parent, I'm going to call it. Uh, I guess it should be lowercase p, shouldn't it? Should it? No, capital P. Um, and then since the health system already, when it creates something, we already specify what we want the parent to be. We make the canvas transform the parent. Uh, it's a simple substitution to just put game UI parent in there. Game UI parent is a transform, so we're already passing in transform as we were before. We're still doing that. Um, and now it will just nest under there. And that means the nice version of this is like, um, so the perk of this approach is that if we said set as first sibling, everything that ever gets created always goes straight to the top. With this way, we could potentially have something that goes, you know, behind the game UI as well. Um, and we can position it manually wherever we want. So I'm hoping that since we're playing the last level, I'll try and get, uh, excuse me, what I've done yet again is to not establish that reference. Um, game UI parent, I just dragged from game UI into the game UI parent slot. And with an auto rail, let's try and get a health bar on screen when I, in the center of the screen when I die. Okay. Damn it. <laughs> it's conveniently just not overlapping with the buttons. Um, yes, perfect. Okay, so the buttons are now appearing on top. So we solved that. Excellent. What is next in our bug list? I've got this written down on my phone. Um, all right, health bars on top of menu is done. Guards spawn facing you. So that the problem is not that they spawn facing you, it's that they spawn too close to you. Um, and we've seen this in some of our tests. Uh, it is surprising because we wrote code specifically to prevent this. We said in level generator, uh, here is the spot, number of guards to create. This must be the loop where we create them. Um, Oh, possible spots, here it is. So before we create guards, we make a list of all the possible spots to put them. And we check, is it far enough from the player? And we do that by doing nav distance. Wait, no. Vector 3 distance. Um, oh yeah, from this nav point to the player. Now, I immediately have an idea of why this might be going wrong. Because since we wrote this code, we created a system where we place a starting uh, position in the level. And when the level starts, we then move the player to it. Well, when does that happen? Uh, there's a thing called starting position, it's a behavior. And in start, it moves the player to itself. Well, when does the level get generated? It's in level generator start. Which one of these things happens first? We don't know. <laughs> there are ways to manually fine tune that order, but you don't want to get into that business. It's a dangerous game. So really, if, any, if we want to rely on the order of operations here, um, we... Uh, don't want these two things to be happening at start. So, um, let me try and remember how I fix this. <laughs> there are a couple of different ways we can do it. Um, yes, okay. It, what we want, the way that the level generator avoids the player is it has a global reference to the player. Why don't we just give it a global reference to the starting position? So in references, we will just say uh, public static um, yeah, let's just say starting position. Starting position. And then in starting position, uh, on awake, we will do references dot starting position equals this, without an 8 in it, hopefully. Um, and then level generator, instead of looking at the player, we'll just look at the starting position. So that should be pretty simple. 
so yeah we don't want to yeah the the bad way to solve this would be try to try to force the start events to happen in the right order and that'll probably fix it but you might forget why you did that you might put something else in that order somewhere else and uh it just feels like a very fragile solution we want to lean into the fact that awake is where we establish references and start is where we start to do stuff um the starting position will already exist and uh we will know where it is uh and that's the position we care about the player might not have moved there yet because that happens in start um but we know where the starting position is and that's what we should avoid if we wanted to be extra secure just in case we anything else ever changed we could check the distance both to the player and to the the starting position i don't think it's a good idea because actually the player is going to be in a different spot at this point and um uh there's no sense in leaving that empty so to test this uh level manager i think we'll go back to starting level one as we logically should and i'm actually going to edit uh not level one but level two because we could edit level one and, and what i want to do is create a load of guards so level two is going to have 20 guards we could do that in level one I don't think it would prove anything because I think the player and the starting position are probably in the same location anyway when that starts. So if it, even if it worked, that's not proof that we fix anything. The proof will be if when you transition to another level with a different starting position that the guards still spawn away from you. So we should be able to just open startup, click play, and ooh, he's going straight for us. That's okay, we don't mind him being close to us and only having a short time to avoid him, but... Alright. So we're in a different position. No guards spawned anywhere near us. And there was 20 guards on this level, and it's a small level. <laughs> so that's pretty good evidence. But we'll do it one more time just to sort of satisfy ourselves. But uh, I believe that is fixed. It's also... Okay, that goes close, but still not actually in our face we could the other thing we do to be extra sure is like make them face away from us when they spawn or make them hit, like choose a nav point that's further from us that kind of thing but i don't mind if you have to like rapidly readjust we we're never actually going to give you 10 guards on a level so um it's fine yep i'm satisfied that works uh what is our next bug Oh, antiques all on the right. Yeah, I don't know if I really flagged this up that much, but I noticed a lot of my own playtests um, that maybe we can we can demonstrate it. If I go to, uh, I think level three will be a good one to check because it's quite big. Uh, so all weapons on the left. Nope, there's an antique right there. Okay, but all the antiques are in the north. Yeah, all the antiques are in the upper half of the, the level. They're not all on the right, are they? But they're all on the north. Let me see if that's reliably true. Yeah, all the antiques are at the top again. There are some... It's, it's sort of top right, isn't it? Like, not 100% consistent, but just in general. The weapons tend to be at the lower end, and antiques tend to be at the top. Definitely in the, in the top half. So... What could be causing this? Uh, we wrote a clever system for ensuring that this would be perfectly evenly distributed. <laughs> and it didn't work. I actually, when I, I figured out what the problem is in, in practice, and um, it rang a bell. I think a commenter might have pointed this out to me at the time, and I just didn't get around to fixing it in, in an actual episode. Uh, so apologies if that was you. Um, it is this. And actually, Visual Studio is not underlining it for me, um, which is... Uh, silly but what I've, I've committed a slightly uh a bit of a maths crime here because float chance of antique equals number of antiques to place divided by number of things to place absolutely logical code except that number of things to place is an int and number of antiques to place is an int when you when you divide an int by an int c sharp will try and keep the answer as still an int and remember integer is a whole number so if you do you know uh 2 divided by 3, it will just tell you 1. And if you do 1 divided by 3, it'll tell you 0. Because it thinks the answer needs to be an int. And that happens even though we specifically said we want to float. <laughs> this is the kind of thing you have to work around with programming. Um, 
we divided two ints, so it gives us an int, and then then later realizes, oh, you wanted a float? Okay, I guess I'll convert that to a float, and, and it will be, now you've got 0 0.0 or 1.0, but you still didn't get one third or two thirds, which is what you really want. So real simple fix, let's just make those floats. Making them ints, it, it's this sort of like mathematical programmery tidiness that is uh, well thought of in general, and perhaps when you're working on a massive team in, uh, in a very formal environment, uh, if something's supposed to be a whole number, you always store it as a whole number. But actually, for our purposes, it's fine to store it as a little float. Float is just a number, and you know we don't want it to be a fraction, but um, the maths is way easier if we store it as a variable type, as a data type that can be stored as a fraction, um, just because then we don't have to convert it. We could. The other thing we do is convert each one of these into a float before doing the division, which is just messy and, and cumbersome. Uh, I think there's no actual reason they need to be ints. They were just ints to just sort of signal to ourselves. That it's like a note to self. This is supposed to be a whole number. Uh, but actually, it doesn't need to be. So let me see if we can detect a difference in how they're distributed. Oh, antique right away at the start. And we start in the lower half. So, yep. And there's weapons in the top. There's weapons all over. There's antiques all over. Let's do one more run just to check. Yep, yep. Actually, they look pretty biased to the south here. Oh no, there's just a lot of them. <laughs> okay, that's completely fixed. Easy one. Uh, boss clipping. So this was a thing I noticed where the boss walked through a wall. Uh, he just is very large uh, and he kind of behaves like he's not. <laughs> he doesn't know how large he is. That's his problem. Uh, let me see if we can, if we can witness it. It'll only happen if he turns a corner, which I guess he'll have to. It's very slow, too. Oh, he's going to go all the way to the point before turning a corner. I think it's like, if he, if the one he's pathing to is directly in front of him, he'll be fine. But if... Um, or if he to restart, then to actually wait for him to repath. If he like wanted to go to one down here, uh, then he will clip through the wall. It's more work than it's worth to try and show you for sure that it's happening. <laughs> um, we will instead. I, I'll t show you what I thought of to fix this. Was like, oh, it's probably when they're navigating, they're using a nav mesh agent, right? Um, and that thing has a radius value that is different to like the enemy scale and the scale of all the things within it. Uh, I should maybe explain that rigid body. I was surprised I saw this area because I, I know that rigid body. You can add a load of different primitives, different shapes, different like cubes and cylinders and stuff as children of the rigid body, and the rigid body will behave as if, okay, that's my shape, like whatever, I'll, I'll figure it out. However compli complicated you've made me, that is my shape, <laughs> I'll accept it uh, and not resent my creator. Uh, but the nav mesh, the nav mesh agent is different. That is when a thing is moving around the nav mesh, when it's trying to figure out how to get to a location, when it's being intelligent, it's not really using its rigid body, it's using its nav mesh agent. And that has its own radius value and I calculated our, our guy's radius is about 7 um, or at least his scale is 7 so I suppose his radius is 43.5 um, but you can change that and it won't have any effect I will change it just because it's correct to, to say it's 3.5 radius um, and again because it I had trouble even showing you the bug in the first place I'm not going to try and test and show you that that didn't help it <laughs> um, uh, so I researched it, and it turns out that you've got to change the nav mesh, which is, that would be a pain in a more complicated game. In our game, it's fine, because as it happens, this level is one where um, this is the only guard, um, and the swarmers and stuff, they use the nav mesh as well, but it doesn't matter if they act like they're bigger than they are. Uh, it matters if they act like they're smaller than they are, but if they act like bigger than they are, they're just being very careful about walls, basically. Uh, so we can actually do, if we type in 3.5 here, and we click bake, what does it look like? Okay, much thinner paths, essentially, so this, these are the routes the, the guard can take. That's very thin, isn't it? Why, why do you think it's avoiding that wall so much more than the other wall? Because there's a big difference. Uh, let me just make it 3, because it doesn't actually, it's not the end of the world if he slightly clips through stuff. Um, and we don't want the swarmers to look wrong. So if you actually really need precise pathfinding with two with differently sized nav mesh agents, apparently you just have to create another nav mesh. And I don't know how to do that, so it's beyond the scope of this tutorial. <laughs> we don't need it for this. This will work fine. Um, 
we just have to customize the agent radius there. Uh, so I guess I'll fire it up and just see if we can... Uh, no, that's not going to work, is it? I need to launch startup. We'll just see if we spot it happening. I just wanted to try and go to a different one. <laughs> the problem is there's actually like two different nav points for each corner, isn't there? Is he going to turn straight around? He is, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he's so slow. Let me, maybe while he's moving, we could um, increase his speed. Because there's actually two speeds. There's uh, speed here. If I increase that, does it change anything? Not really. Nav mesh agent speed, though. That does increase something. We don't really want him. So this change won't be saved because I'm making it at runtime. I mean, he's doing a good job, isn't he? Bloody hell. I was trying to... I felt like I wasn't moving, so I clicked the button to make sure that the window had focus, and then... Oh my god, he looks angry now. I mean, actually, having him move fast while he's aggroed is really funny. Because <laughs> he looks really annoyed. It's the angriest boss. Uh, but I'm not going to do it on this episode, because, again, it's going to be a long one. Uh... All right, that bug is also fixed. The last one, and you saw it in this very episode, was that if there's only one guard and you snipe him real fast, the enemies don't spawn. And it's not a huge problem. It's only It only can possibly happen in level one. Uh, there's never a way to, to kill multiple enemies in one shot later. Um, but uh, we're going to fix it because it's going to be useful for a different thing later. Because... Basically, the logic that if there's no enemies existing, we immediately move on to the next level and there's no chance to, to pause at all is bad because when we come to make a tutorial, I want the first level to have no guards in it. And I don't want the first level to auto-complete as soon as it happens. So having some code to make sure that we don't progress too fast is a good idea. Now, where did I decide that, that, level, that code should live? Um, on Level Manager. So Level Manager is what decides when to move on to the next level. And if I hit Control T and type Level Manager, I'll find it. So this is the part that detects all enemies are dead and then moves on. I am just going to have a public bool enemies have spawned. That is the real test. Have enemies spawned. Um, and do you know what? What does level manager do anything when this when a new level starts? It doesn't. Okay, I'm actually going to move this to alarm manager. Um, because it doesn't really matter, you could do it either way. But um, this is going to be set by enemy spawner. So when enemy spawner actually spawns enemies, it's got this countdown. Once the countdown uh, has expired, then it's actually going to instantiate something. So here we're going to do references dot alarm manager dot enemies are spawned equals true. Um, then in level manager, when we're checking is the level complete, we don't just check is the enemy count zero. We check uh, that alarm manager knows that they've spawned. And the key thing is when does it get reset? Uh, and luckily, a lab manager has a setup level function. That's why I want to put it on here, because it, a lab manager does something every time this, the new level is loaded. And if we set it to false there, that should mean that it gets reset correctly every level. So let's go back to starting on level one. And I'm hoping for a sniper rifle. Shotgun might do it. Yeah, that, that's the scenario that, that was going wrong before. Uh, let me start again to see if we get a sniper. Yeah, we do. Uh, and it's got to be point blank range to properly test this. Basically, I want I want to be sure that there was a moment where there were no enemies in the, in the game. Don't really like how he's moving. Okay. <laughs> Damn it, I forgot to select the sniper rifle. Okay, select the sniper rifle. Don't let him see you. Okay, it's going left. That's good. Yeah, that's definitely working. Cool. That's all bugs fixed, as far as I know. There, there could be other bugs with our system, but uh, I don't know of any others. 
So, the thing we didn't do at the end of last episode was a death screen, and I'd like to do that now. So, in our essentials, in Canvas, we've got this game UI, we've got a menu. Um, I, what we want, what we're looking for is when you die, we want to show you your score. And actually, now that you can win the game, we also want to say whether you died or whether you won the game. And we'll say your current score and your best score. Uh, so that is going to be a menu, but it's not going to be like the main menu of where it's a lot of different buttons. It's going to be more like the credits menu where it just shows some text and has the option to go back. So I'm going to select the credits menu and do control D. I'm curious to see. Um, let's turn it on so we can see it. Uh, let me see what the back button does. OK, it goes back to the main menu. That's exactly what I hoped it would. Uh, let us rename this to score menu. Uh, credits text, I'm going to call this verdict uh, because I wanted to say stuff like that. <laughs> um, right now, I, I'm surprised to find this, but the, um, the size, oh no, it, it is set just manually. OK, I want it to be a little bit smaller than that. Uh, in fact, the back button is 297.51. I don't like that. I'm going to make it 300. Uh, I'm going to make this 300 too. And do 100. Uh, and then let's duplicate it twice. And we will, uh, let me see, collapse these so that we can drag those up here. And top one is going to be score. Uh, let me take cap stock off and type that again. Then the second one is going to be best score and <laughs> visually it looks like it says dead 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 doesn't it uh, it's going to look something like this and something like that so uh, I think I'll make these just a little bit less less opaque best score could be fainter still for whatever reason and it's text could be gold because it's the best one Probably both of them should be bold anyway. Uh, and that should be about all we need. Um, but how are these values going to be updated? Now, we could give Canvas Manager a reference to all of these things individually. Um, and we can have Score Manager talk to Canvas Manager to do that. We could also, there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. But what I want to do is just create a new script on the Score menu called Score Menu. And it will hold its own references, manage itself. This is the kind of thing you do when your menu system is getting bigger. When we only had main menu, it made sense for Canvas Manager to manage it all. Now that we have sub-menus with our own complexity, uh, we want to have their own behaviors too. So I'm going to say public text mesh pro no uh, you GUI. Let me type it exactly right, and then it will have no excuse to not give me the options to <laughs> import that. Yes, here we go. Using TM Pro. Um, verdict text. And let me paste that twice. And we'll say score text and best score text. Now, all of these things need to be configured when the menu turns on. I That's not start. Start is going to be when it's first created. And maybe because of the way this, our game flow works, when you start a new game, it will get destroyed and recreated, so start would run again. But just in case, I think the safest place to put it is on enable. Every time this is turned on, whether that's because it was just created, whether it's because it used to be disabled, now it's been enabled, whatever, that's when we want to update everything. And uh, I would like, let's do the score stuff first. Score text dot text equals uh, managers, sorry, no, <laughs> that's the structure from my other game, references dot uh, score manager dot uh, score, right? Uh, oh, to string. And as before, I, I don't know if we actually do this on our score display in game, but if we do n0 in quote marks there, that will format it as a number. The main thing that'll do is put commas every 1000, uh, which is just makes it more readable. And not, it's not best score, is it? It's actually high score. And, okay, I probably should have called it high score text. In fact, let's rename it now. Because it hasn't been used yet. The high score is the best score, but uh, let's stick to our naming convention. And then verdict.text. Um, 
Well, in some cases, that's going to be dead. And in other cases, it's going to be victory. So what determines that? It's whether the player is still alive. Well, actually, we destroy the player on death. So if we just say, if references dot the player equals null, then it's safe to assume we're dead. And if it isn't null, and we're showing the score screen, it's because we won. And so we can do victory. Uh, and that should do it, I think. Well, that, that'll make the menu function. Um, of course, the next thing to do is like, when, when should it show? Um, and level manager is probably the place to do this because that's what that detects when all enemies are dead um it also detects when we are dead and shown death menu because false uh here it says references dot canvas uh dot show main menu uh let's let's say you go to that i'm going to control click this uh and i'm going to duplicate this function instead of show main menu let's say show score menu and that is going to have a show menu function. We need an object for it to refer to, so let's uh, create a new one called score menu. So the this is the canvas behavior. It's going to have a reference to the score menu. So I'm going to click on canvas. It's going to say score menu down here, and I'm going to drag our score menu in there. And let's get back to where we were. I'm using control minus here to jump back to where I was. I find that quite useful. Um, we created a thing called show score menu, but it doesn't reference it yet. So let's do, sorry, the word show doesn't go in there. Uh, and then if I keep going back, I'll get to here where we said show main menu. We don't want that anymore. We want to show, show score menu. And now it looks to me like this keeps track of whether it's shown that menu or not and sets it to, to true when it has. Uh, I'm saying that in a curious voice because in practice I would swear I had to do extra logic to, to make that not keep showing it. But let's see if this works. Because that's quite a lot of untested stuff. Oh, oh I can see one problem immediately. We're going to see the death menu right away. Uh, also, oh, I didn't set up any of these references. <laughs> Probably a new record for me is number of unset references. Um, verdict text is the text that's under the verdict object. Score text is the text that's under the score object. High score text is the text that's under the best score object. Uh, and at the end of it all, we only turned those on so we could see what we're doing. We actually turn it off uh, by default. Okay. So let's get ourselves killed. There we go. Our score is indeed 85. Our best score is indeed 10,252. Uh, and that's how it shook out. Let me test it again for some reason, even though it's obviously working fine. Getting a score is... Oh, I actually got 60... Oh god, just running into enemies actually gets you score because they have bounty. <laughs> okay, yep, that all works. Um, the thing we haven't tested yet is what happens if you win. Uh, and all I've got to do to test that is to win. Uh, that's easier said than done, so I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give myself, I've got 10 health points but normally. Let's give myself 10,000. And then let's set level manager to start on level 9 so we can defeat the boss. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, there's one more thing we have to do, obviously. When you defeat the boss, how is it going to know that the game is over? We haven't told it that yet. So um, I'm going to go back to health system for this because health system, again, is the only thing that knows when something died. And if we look at our curator, they have a health system. Let's double click it and let's uh, just create a new public bool show score menu. And then in health system, when we take damage, here's this is where we die. Um, let's say if show show score menu, then references dot canvas dot show score menu that makes sense doesn't it love it when code is just self-evident once you type it out uh, and then all that needs to happen is that the curator themselves which I already have open uh, just checks that so I could have called that variable short show score menu on death that would have been more correct uh, but we'll live with it so now I've just got to win and did I already set level manager to spawn level 9 yes I did Cool. 
auto rail is not going to cut it. Uh, rail burst, maybe auto shotgun. That's more like it. And if they could have two, that would be lovely. There are indeed two. Okay, that's a pretty good, pretty good start. You can't do that in normal play. Okay, twenty of each. And there it is. <laughs> that is indeed victory. I actually really like that it stops the instant you kill him. That's no need to do anything else. And in fact, it's kind of good because there's also... That doesn't mean the enemies are irrelevant because I would have got more points if I killed them. And also that was way easier than normally would be. Alright, beautiful. We've done score menu. That was actually really quick. Um, I, I did it about in practice, figuring out how to do that, so it took me longer. Uh, how are we doing in the episode in general? 40 minutes. Alright, this might not be an extra long one. Because all we've got left to do... Oh, one more cleanup thing um, while we're at it is that Canvas Behavior, I notice, still has a scene asset reference. Scene asset is a system that I, I used at first and then I discovered you can't build your game if you do that, so let's not do that. And if I delete it, something will break. It will tell me this start new game function now can't function because of this. And that's a little bit alarming at first until you realize it says zero references here. That's because um, this is no reference. We don't use Canvas to start a new game anymore. That is done by Level Manager. Um, let me show you that that's true. Start a new game. That also has zero references. So actually, don't, <laughs> don't read too much into the zero references because if you hook a button up to it in the inspector, Visual Studio doesn't know about that. Um, all right. So, yeah, so that's just a thing we need to do to be able to build our game. Um, so, tutorial. Uh, this is now a tutorial on how to make a tutorial. Uh, the kind of tutorial I want to make is one where you, rather than, the tutorial I hate is when you, you're trying to play the game and it pops up a dialogue box with like a huge load of text and you're supposed to read that entire thing then click OK and then you play for like three more seconds and it pops up another one. Uh, or even worse, it shows you like three of them at once and you're supposed to read all of them to understand different things without having to try them. Uh, luckily our game is fairly simple so it doesn't really warrant that anyway but in particular I like when the text is just like there for you to read but it's not stopping you from playing so because our game is is has a lot of visual blank space uh, we are well set up to do this so I'm going to create a new level I'm going to duplicate level one select it control D and I'll call it tutorial one I think we will need more than one tutorial level when I open it up and look at the scene view I'm going to check that Z is facing forwards and I'm going to go to level chunks and drag in the middle chunk because that's a nice plain one uh, and I'm going to move it to the middle I guess that is the middle um, and now let's go into level generator because we're going to do the same trick we did with the boss level where we tell the level generator that this level is zero by zero because we don't want it to make any chunks we just want to stick with the ones it has but I do want your help level generator to uh, Fill the plinths with random weapons, that's good. Uh, fraction of plinths to be antiques is zero, that's correct. I don't want there to be any antiques in the first level. First level I want to teach you how to move, how to pick up a weapon, how to switch weapons, and then there'll be no danger at all until you fire. And when you fire, that'll obviously set off the alarm, the swarmers will come in, and you'll have to deal with those, and that'll be your introduction to combat. So you'll have all the time in the world to read the text before anything bad happens, uh, and only if and when you defeat the, the swarmers do you progress to the next level. Uh, so, I would like it to spawn zero guards. No guards at all. And this is where our new code for not progressing until enemies are spawned will help. Um, everything else is good. I think next level name up tutorial 2. Um, and so, now all we need is actual guidance. <laughs> um, we need to actually show you uh, some text. So, I don't want this to be on screen. I want it to be in the world. Uh, and since we're a top-down game, it should be fairly easy to do that. Uh, I'm just going to create it, I think, just by clicking here. Maybe I'll click an empty space. And create UI. I'm hoping there's canvas here. And one of the options under canvas is screen space overlay. I actually want to change that to world space. So a world space canvas is text in the world. Um, if you've seen... Fringe, <laughs> you've seen that they do their titles in world. They have world space titles. Um, 
another what's the other word diegetic right diegetic is in world and exegetic is outer world um but it's pretty huge and vertical right now i'm gonna add an image to it like i always do to, so that i can see its full extent <laughs> it's just the size of a planet uh so a couple of things wrong with that um one is let me just try width and height okay maybe who knows where it's gone now um I mean, why is the position that as well? Now, all these values are kind of set up to be screen space values. You know, your screen is 1920 by 1080 or, or whatever. Uh, but then world, those are meters. So that's why it's huge. Um, and same for position. So let's try and get it facing the right way. Now, I want to rotate this. And when you rotate something, the axis you want to do it in is the axis. <laughs> um, <laughs> can't tell if I if that's a tautology um, basically it, if you imagine an axle go like going through something um, then that is the dimension you want to type the value into so I see the red arrow being the one we want to tilt it over or I go like that um, so let's try an X rotation of 90 and sure enough it faces well it seems to face upwards let's see if it really does we don't really know which way it's facing until we create some text on it. So I'm going to right click it now and say UI Text Mesh Pro. Um, I, it's going to be enormous, uh, but let's just say hello and shrink the font size. Oh, let me make it centered in both vertical and horizontal, and then keep reducing the font size till it makes kind of sense. Probably don't need the Actually, let's just, uh, for now, let's just reduce the opacity of the image on the canvas so that we can see what we're doing. Um, and yeah, let's move the canvas to where we want it. So I think the canvas is going to live, oh, okay, it's, it's quite high up. Uh, the first thing to do is get it down to the level that we want it at, and you'll see it disappears at some point, so we'll have it just slightly above that. That will let us understand. It's perfect width, isn't it? Um, and I guess we'll go to the rectangle tool so we can make it the right height as well. Now it doesn't need to fill this, I'm just doing it so that we kind of know where our bounds are. Um, font size of seven is still way, way too big. <laughs> um, and let me get up the text of what I want to say, uh, just so I'm not composing it off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, so I just want to explain movement. So WASD, movement. Uh, E, steel stuff, left mouse, fire, right mouse, switch, weapon. So I'm typing that all out so I can see how small I need to make it before this all fits. Um, that fits. And let me just put the spaces in between it just so that it's kind of more inviting to read. Now I will turn off the image because it doesn't need that anymore. Um, yeah, let's see how that works. So to test the tutorial, I'm just going to change what the first level is in startup. Obviously, that's not going to be uh, sufficient in the end. We're going to need a way to choose between tutorial and the main game. I've just typed in level one, haven't I? <laughs> that's not tutorial one at all. Hasn't been added to the build settings. That is a good point, although still a stupid system. So we've added the build settings now. And there's no enemies, which is good. Let me maximize this. Because you, it's kind of good actually, like, because you work at such a small game window, you're tempted to make all the UI much bigger than it needs to be. And that's probably a good thing, just for accessibility, just to make sure everyone can read it. Um, but in this case, I do want to just check how it feels to sort of at full screen. So WSD movement, E to steal stuff. We're not explaining the alarm system yet, because uh, you can steal as much as you like and no, no alarm is going to go off. Uh, so I know for sure that no one's going to flood in until you shoot. Uh, so I feel that's pretty fair game in terms of like giving you a chance to read what's going on before you progress. So let's duplicate it and make tutorial 2.
which has named itself perfectly. Um, this one, I think we want uh, several blocks dragging in more empty, nope, not empty chunks, middle chunks. Uh, and I'll use the move tool to get this on the right place. That looks about right. In level generator, I'm going to say, yeah, you can have some antiques now. 50% antiques. You can have one guard. Um, and what kind of text are we going to do? Uh, let me duplicate this and I'll move one over here. So this is outside the canvas technically. It doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> uh, so we're not going to worry about that. Um, and let's explain the alarm system next. So alarm sounds if you uh, steal three things, fire a gun, or are seen by a guard. That's our alarm system. And next we'll explain uh, how you get money. So I always hate writing those values in text because that value might change and then the text needs to be changed separately. There are ways to you know have it refer to a value in code, but it's it's more complex than our, our remit. Um, somebody who's pay a bounty uh, if you kill them fast enough. So that's just to explain that the um, uh, Huh. I wonder why the text isn't wrapping. I mean, I can wrap it if you like, but... Yeah, I'll just do it manually, I guess. Uh, if you make it auto-size, it will wrap. But... Yeah, isn't this an option, in fact? Oh, wrapping enabled. Hmm. What? How big is this text element, then? Surely it's the size of the canvas, isn't it? I'm actually not seeing the handles on it. Is it really big? Is it that size? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> what the hell? Why are you so huge? No wonder you're not wrapping. Okay, so that, that must have inherited the canvas's crazy scale at some point, and... Um, we have paid the price. <laughs> um, so its width is 10, let's make its height 10 as well. Um, and now I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna undo my manual wrapping because if I ever change it, it'll be nice that it, it doesn't do that. Okay, and duplicate this one more time because we've got one more bit of text to impart, which is just gonna be what you're doing in the game, which is uh, keep stealing till the alarm sounds um, deal with the reinforcements make as much money as you can uh, a lot of those awkwardly go on to the next line I'm gonna make it slightly smaller just so it all fits on um, let's make it 0.6 all right that seems to work all right so, this is tutorial 2, we're due to start on tutorial 1, and that's already set up to take us to tutorial 2, I believe. Uh, so let's just see if that works. Sniper, that's the worst weapon to have here. Railgun, that's a lot better. Nope, hasn't managed to build settings. Can I do it right now? I feel like I checked this last time and I think it might have worked. Ah. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> Avoid swearing. Um, Alright. Still very satisfying, that. Alright. Alarm sounds if you steal three things, fire a gun, or are seen by a guard. We don't explain the alarm grace period, and I'm okay with that, because um, 
Antiques worth 200. Are they worth 200? Oh, that wasn't an antique. <laughs> um, I think they are. And keep stealing to the alarm sounds, deal with the reinforcements, make as much as you can. Yeah, so I I don't mind that we don't explain the alarm period. Oh, look at that. It takes me straight back to the, the same level. Um, because the grace period when the alarm goes off is, is kind of a finesse thing. It's really about, like, um, you know, you, you won't miss the countdown. You won't miss that there's no alarm blaring. Uh, you're going to see this is happening. If you don't understand that's happening, if you think the alarm's already gone off and you've got to panic, uh, you will panic, but you won't fail to play the game. You'll still be able to progress. You're, you're not going to be stuck because of that. Uh, you'll perform slightly worse. And hopefully, I mean, yeah, hopefully you will just realize through playing that, that there's a better way that you can use this great spirit to steal more than three things. And that will be, you know, uh, a nice little experience for you. So, when this level ends, uh, we need to go to the next one. And uh, let me remind myself how I did that. Okay, yes. So, when we want a property of a level that um, is going to vary per level, uh, level generator is where we do most of that, right? This is the, all the properties of this level. So let's create a variable on level generator that is something like public bool show menu when done. And that will be false on most levels, but on this one it will be true. And it's not going to be level generator that, that figures out when we're done with the level. It's level manager, isn't it? We've handled this a few times. And then where it says go to next level, let's instead check if references dot level generator dot show menu when done then references dot canvas dot show main menu i would say uh, else we actually will get the, the thing um yes This might be the one where we, we might need some extra code here to stop this from triggering over and over again. But let's see how we go. So I'm hoping to see a new bool down here. Show menu when done. And we will go from startup. I don't mind that we've got to replay this first level because it's very easy. As I've demonstrated. And maybe I can have an Uzi instead of that. So, what happens now? Alright, yeah, okay. This is... <laughs> this is indeed the problem. Um, so it is showing the right menu, but I can't click anything. And I believe that is because it is constantly re-showing that same menu. Uh, so... We need some way of just detecting that that has happened. Um, and I think it would be fine. What if it only happens um, if the countdown hit zero this turn, this tick? So, I mean, really, this whole thing is is should only happen if we actually uh, if we were previously above zero so this is a, a pattern we've used before to, to detect the moment that a timer does tick down um, if the if there's more seconds left then tick the seconds down uh, I guess wait why does that oh I see that that has nothing to do with it that's just uh, we should stop the alarm right away no matter what doesn't matter if we keep re-triggering that uh, but if there is seconds left, then we take it down, and only if we just, this minute, got it down below zero, then we show the main menu uh, and or go to the next level. So that will always trigger when the timer comes up, and it will only trigger once, I think I'm right in saying.
just gonna shotgun. Hey, look at that. Now I can go to a new game. All right. I mean, that would work, really. Um, just the game launches into the tutorial, and when the tutorial is done, it shows the main menu, and you can start a new game from there. But if you missed something, if you weren't paying attention, um, I would like you to have the ability to replay the, the tutorial. How are we doing on time? Okay, that is an hour. So this will be a slightly long episode. Um, so we want a menu option to start the tutorial. Making the menu option is going to be the easy part, um, but we'll do it first. And so this is not going to be a new menu, it's going to be a new button on the menu. And it's going to be a lot like a new game button, but it's going to be called tutorial button. Uh, let's move it up even above the new game button. Let's change its text to say tutorial. And then what is its function going to be? Um, I think level manager is where we have a new game function, right? Start new game. Let us uh, create a new one called start tutorial. Excuse me. And this is going to load a scene called start tutorial. We haven't made that scene yet. Um, and in fact, we're going to rename startup to be start game. So we're going to have two different scenes uh, that will both work like our startup scene, but one of them takes you to the tutorial, one of them takes you to, to a new game. So let me just hook that up uh, such that this button it does indeed go to level manager, but instead of start new game, it should be start tutorial. Um, and then what are those scenes going to look like? So I've left this till last intentionally because uh, we're going to do something we haven't needed to do before, which is um, make our essentials object into a prefab. Drag it into assets. It's now a prefab. So this is always a thing we could have done. And it's sort of it, it was weird that our player is not part of a prefab, uh, but I am a great believer in that if you don't need it to be a prefab, don't make it a prefab, because then there's two versions of it, and one of them can get out, out of whack with the other. But we do now need it to be a, a prefab. So we're going to read this to start game. That was our startup scene. Now I'm going to duplicate it, and then I'm going to say start tutorial. And so these are going to be the same scene. I could have just duplicated it anyway without making that a prefab, but the point of making it a prefab is if we ever change it with them we'll just change the prefab version and both scenes will update automatically the danger of ever duplicating data is that then when you change one version you haven't changed the other version and maybe you wanted to and you forgot um so the only difference between these is just going to be what level manager does um in start game it's going to load level one and in start tutorial i will indeed save that it will load tutorial one which is already set up to do so uh, let me see. I think in build settings, we're going to want to add uh, start games already in there because that's a rename of our existing scene. Start tutorial should be in there. Not only that, but start tutorial should be at the top because when we just launch our game, you know, so far we've always been clicking the play button and that will launch whatever scene you have open. But when you're just releasing your game, uh, Unity needs to know what scene do you want me to load first because the, the player hasn't loaded the scene. Um, so we'll put tutorial first because when you first launch the game I want you to play the tutorial and then when you finish the tutorial we'll bring you to the menu. From there you can either replay the tutorial if you want or more probably you'll start a new game. So this should be what the player sees when they start. It's a big menu that's on all the time <laughs> um, because I edited the menu and I left it enabled which I shouldn't have done. Uh, so I have... Let me just recap what I did there. I'm in the start tutorial scene. I'm not going to edit it here. I'm going to open the essentials prefab because I want to, I want these changes to propagate to both versions. And all I'm going to do is make the main menu non-visible. And then start the game. Okay, that's the tutorial. Uh, got not the best stuff. Oh, is that it? <laughs> wow. Um, let's just snipe this dude. And zap all the enemies. That should show me the menu. And when I, from the menu, choose new game, this is the real game. This is not the tutorial, which is exactly what I wanted. Uh, let 
Let me play it a bit. Oh, I've still got 10,000 health, haven't I? <laughs> Let's change that quickly. Um, but let me just check that going to tutorial from here works. Yes, it does. And going to new game from here works. Yes, it does. Beautiful. All right, let me fix the player. Again, I'm going to have to edit the essential prefab, not the instances. This is um, why we didn't do it sooner. The player's health is 10, right? It wasn't 100. No. Um, and we could test from here, but actually, let's try building. Because this is... We, I can't believe we've never done this, but we've never tried building a game. And in fact, some commenters uh, caught that um, uh, it there were some problems with building it earlier. Uh, so I'm just going to create a new folder called build, and we'll build it there. You can build it wherever you like. There's an annoying delay before it shows anything at all, before it even registers that it's going to do anything, <laughs> which usually makes you think, hey, did you not do that? Should I do it again? But let's let it run. So that scene reference we deleted in the canvas, that's one of the things that probably would have prevented us from building. It takes a while. <laughs> Almost long enough to get a drink, not quite. Oh, here we go. We actually chose build and run, didn't we? And this, I'm very pleased to see this. I didn't realize this until I, until I did the practice, but... Um, our version of Unity is old enough that we still get this nice little scratch screen. So this is, um, lets you choose your graphic settings, like making a graphic settings menu and making a controls customization menu is way beyond the scope of this tutorial. It's, it's a sort of a, um, you know, it's a feature that takes work <laughs> um, and is kind of a luxury. I mean, you do, you do definitely want it. If you're going to charge money for a game, you definitely want both these things. Um, and for a free game, it's definitely nice to have, and it's, it's an accessibility thing, especially reassigning inputs. That's the thing a lot of people need um, to be able to play well. And Unity horribly scrapped it. In recent versions of Unity, you don't get this. You can't have it. There's no way to, to have your game launch with this. So everybody has to code their own custom graphics and input menu. The upshot of which is just people won't do it. Like, you know, I wouldn't do it for a, um, a free game at this point because uh, it's a load of work. And that's a real shame because it just was a great accessibility feature. Sure, it looks a bit cheap and cheerful, but when you're making a free game or a low price game, um, that's fine. And it just, the functionality is there, it just works. Anyway, it's great that our game has it. Thank God we chose this version of Unity because um, players can now customize controls easily. And when we click play, we get that splash screen because we're using the free version. Um, if you pay, you can get rid of that, but it's no great hardship. I, yeah, UI is all working nicely. It all fills the screen. That was the problem when I, in practice, that, that it wasn't doing that. Um, and it's actually really weird to see. I'm not going to talk over it because I know that I adjusted game volume okay for Unity, but I don't know if running the game separately is going to have a different volume level, so that might have been deafening. I apologize if so. Um, yeah, it's nice to see it full screen, like properly full screen. Uh, you don't. I haven't seen it this way very often. So let me actually steal some antiques and I'll go get a sniper to deal with this guy. I don't really like the railgun as much as I used to. And then, oh. Completed the tutorial. Let's go on to the main game. And let me just uh, play and see how far I get. I mean, I probably will talk over the the game noise, uh, just because otherwise I'm going to be silent for quite a while. <laughs> but I will uh, try not to say anything important. So, lovely antiques, Uzi. Uh, let me. Okay. I've done something wrong, haven't I? Do I not have another weapon? See if I can out duke the guard with my pistol alone to save on ammo. <laughs> I think I was going to lose in health what I was getting ammo. Oh, hello. Where are you guys coming from? That doesn't look right, does it? Uh, what level is this? Probably two? Yeah, I think that's level two. Uh, let me go through and check that we have baked our levels correctly. If I go to level two, scene. Navigation, yeah, that's way off, isn't it? 
Well, let's do that. Let me do a quick audit of navigation on all of these. I mean, level one we would have noticed, surely. Level two we just checked. Level three looks fine. I'll zoom out. Uh, level four, level five, level six, level seven, level eight, level nine. With the crazy... <laughs> it looks so gawky, doesn't it? Like, it's not like I made a really weird, irregular level. These are all at very regular intervals and everything. <laughs> it's something like, whoa, I don't know how we get around this crazy space. Uh, Alright, uh, I honestly think we're done. That was a small fix. Um, you know, we'll, we would build again to, to update that, but I don't need to show you doing that, because nothing new will happen. So, wow. Thank you for joining me on this. Uh, slightly longer than expected journey <laughs> didn't get crazy long my game maker one i think was 24 episodes and this is 32 um and they're about the same length uh, episodes um so unity has taken me longer i do think game maker's probably faster to make stuff if i mean that comes with so many caveats though because the version of game maker i did the tutorial for is discontinued you can't use it at all anymore um the current version of game maker doesn't have a good free version um uh and so and the, I also don't know how to use the current version of Game Maker, so I can't really recommend it at this point. I, I definitely recommend Unity. <laughs> That's a good thing to say at the end, isn't it? Thank God I don't recommend... I mean, thank God I do recommend Unity. <laughs> I was about to say, actually, you shouldn't have learned this. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely the thing to learn. It is just slightly slower going than, than Game Maker, I think, for an absolute beginner. But it stands you in much better stead from now on. Like, this is what a lot of indie teams use. It's what some AAA teams use. Um and uh, it's a really useful skill set. Um, and if you've got to the end of episode 32, uh, I would say you have the determination it takes to make a game. Like that is, we've made a game. You can make one of similar scope now by yourself in less time than that, I reckon. Um, and from there, it's just a question of scope. And I will do another little standalone video just on advice where to go from here, like making your first game, kind of just tips and stuff, um, especially in terms of scope. Uh, so I won't go into that too much here, but this is really just a save. Well done. Like, <laughs> you've done really well to get this far, and it's very impressive. Um, and also, thank you so much to everyone who commented along the way, because the comments were absolutely lovely. I didn't want to say anything at the time, because I thought if I tweet out that my the comments on my videos are amazing, I'm going to get, like, some assholes showing up just to ruin it. <laughs> but they didn't. But we made it the whole way. Uh, a few spammers I had to, to block, but... Uh, everyone who actually had watched the videos and, and was saying something about them was just incredibly lovely and it was super motivating to me. This hasn't been easy. <laughs> I, uh, when I started the thing, uh, it started this specifically because of the pandemic. I was like, okay, you know, we're all stuck at home. Uh, I've been meaning to do a tutorial for a while. This is the time to do it, especially as people might be rethinking their careers, might have more spare time than usual, um, might be not doing some social stuff they used to be doing. Um, and I didn't, entirely factor in that my own capacity to do my job and to <laughs> keep up with my life would be drastically reduced and that taking on another like uh, task on top of that would be uh, challenging but I mean I came at it and I think I said this right at the start there's no fixed schedule there's no I didn't pressure myself to like oh no I haven't done one this week I've got to push myself and, and get stressed about it I just took it at my own pace and frankly you paid the price <laughs> which is just that sometimes the episodes are really far apart like months apart and uh, sometimes there were three in a week uh, so uh, hopefully that wasn't too frustrating for those who are following along in real time. I imagine most people who, who follow this will be coming to it, you know, after it started. Um, and so hopefully that won't, won't be a problem for that. And yeah, thank you so much for joining me and well done. <laughs>